Well, 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 if it isn't Luke Westaway, the man who would be GM. No, I d well, well, no, no, oh gosh, oh man, that was such an intimidating beginning. Oh no. Um, so, you think you've got what it takes, do you? Well, the good news, Luke, is that you absolutely do have what it takes because GMing a pen and paper role playing game like Dungeons and Dragons is not yep. actually that hard. So, um, yes, that's great. That's uh, exactly the level of difficulty I like things to be at. Exactly, there we go, perfect. All it really requires is a bit of planning and then the ability to think on your feet, which you demonstrated ably when you ran um, Werewolf for everybody. Um, well, it was it was running that Werewolf game that made me think for the first time, I wonder if this is something that could feasibly be within my skill set eventually. Um, and, I, and I had so much fun doing it. I had way more fun running at the game than I did playing it, yeah. which, um, which, I, which I didn't think would be the case. So, well, yeah, it was kind of that stream that made me think, maybe this is something I should talk to you about. And I'm glad you did, because uh, now we get to sort of not only show you uh, sort of my own process, even though everyone's is, is obviously different, but also we get to show the lovely people at home, and then hopefully we can send out a small army of, of budding GMs that will slowly take over the planet. I don't think there'll be anything slow about it. <laughs> um, It'll be quick. So what I thought would be useful for this very first session is obviously, uh, ideally, you're, you you have some questions sort of bubbling away in your brain, but yes. I also thought we should take a look at the notes I have from one of the Ox Ventures and sort okay. of break down how it is that was planned. Um, so do you, first off, like, what, do, do you have any sort of broad questions about how to DM? Um, I feel like the thing that I'm most worried about is stuff to do with rules which is not one specific thing but mm. i think the the thing that um the thing that alarms me is is not sort of responding to what players might do mm -hmm. um or you know or planning in advance of a fun campaign because i feel like those things are kind of share a skill set with actually playing the game in that it's kind of improvising and, and as you say thinking on your feet what kind of gives me the creepy crawlies is the thought of a player saying i want to do such and such and me being like okay all right and then trying to think like piercing damage or like, you know like a, like is that a can you kick something like how how fast can you move and i know that a lot of that will just be sort of memorizing and and practice but i i suspect you must have some internal or possibly external techniques for just keeping all of this stuff to hand um, and accessible i think a lot of it for me was just learning by doing so I'll come back to what I think the most important skill is. But for example, okay. the longest time, I just couldn't remember the rules for grappling. Um, so even during live shows, I just have it bookmarked and I'd have it next to me. Um, and the good thing about having reference material and a brain and anxieties is that you can, you can predict what's going to worry you should it come up because you're already worried about it. Like if you're scared that someone's gonna say, okay, I want to do this, or here's piercing damage. You can just bookmark how that stuff works. And honestly, like, the, the first thing to remember is that everyone around the table is behind you. Like, they want to have fun, but they also want you to have fun, and they want you to feel comfortable. So if you want to say, hey, look, I just, I'm going to take a minute, I'm just going to look this up so we're doing it right, then more often than not, they'll be like, okay, that's fine. Or somebody might have that knowledge locked away, and they'll just say, oh, it's this. Um, but also, um, it's important to remember that you can just throw things off to the side. I've done that more times than I can remember in the Ox Venture. And there's kind of a bit of conventional wisdom which says, if you can't find the information in 30 seconds, just make it up. So That's a, that's a good rule, 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it doesn't mean that you then have to sort of sprint through the book to find stuff. And if you are concerned about getting something right, like for example, if somebody somebody's hit points got reduced to zero and he wanted to remember how death saves work um, you know it is fine to take time and do that it's been a long time since I incapacitated anybody for example so if I wanted somebody to start making death saves I would have to look it up and that's fine because yeah, it's because it's really important exactly yeah and that's something you can kind of lampshade and say like you know I'm gonna look this up because it's important we get this right and then you look at it and then you can come back in and 
re-establish yourself as basically an authority on the rules. Be like, okay, so it is this. So what we're now going to do is this. How often, it, say for example, you uh, you didn't know something, you were like, oh, I'll go to look it up, and you're, mm. you're sort of looking, and it's getting close to that kind of 30 second mark in your head and you still haven't found it. Would you then go, oh, you know what? I can't find it, let's just, or would you go, aha, here we are, and then lie, essentially? <laughs> um, there are definitely times when I would lie and just be like, oh, okay, well, so, or ask a question to be like, so just run me through it again. So what you're doing is this. And then, you know, nice. because we've been obviously with, you know, um, social distancing and quarantine rules, I've been playing um, all of my pen and paper role playing games on a computer. And I've got little a... notes, by the way. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Perfect. Keep going. Sorry. Um, I've got a second monitor. So I'll have D&D Beyond or a PDF of whatever rule book open. Okay. Um, and if someone says, I want to do this, I'm pretty much instantly my you know i'm over there either searching what it is if i if i'm not comfortable remembering it or just doing a control f in the in the, the pdf and just searching for the right term nice but okay you don't have to look things up all the time um i would say actually in terms of dming and specifically when it comes to something like dungeons and dragons the most important skill you need is the ability to call um, for checks and the right check as and when you need it. Okay. So somebody will say, I want to backflip onto the roof. And you'll say, okay, that's dexterity acrobatics because yep. it's the one that makes the most sense. Yeah. So the honestly, the one best thing you can do for yourself as a DM is having the list of skills and their tied um, attributes in front of you. Because... Nice. You know, uh, some will say, "I want to, I want to go have a snoop around there." You'd be like, "Okay, oh, cool, well, that sounds like investigate." You glance at it, you're like, "Yeah, it's definitely investigate." It tells you that that that's tied to intelligence. Intelligence. Yeah. There we go. See, I've, I've got Dob's character sheet here, right, exactly, which is so knackered and beat up. <laughs> but I feel like that's in character. I feel like. Oh, 100 yeah. percent. If you haven't got a character sheet that's shown some sort of battle scarring, then mm. in fact, who's this? Is this Rust on the Harbour? That's Rust on the Harbour. Okay, there we go. Na, 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 na. Hey, um, cool. So yeah, just just being able to look at that, look at that list, that'll see you through 99 percent of all encounters. Um, and it really, like you say, that is not different at all uh, from playing, because. You know, you've you've been in enough games of Dungeons and Dragons. You'll know somebody will start talking, and the way they describe it, they already have the check in mind that they need to make. Right. You know, okay. like um, Andy might say, you know, I'm going to try and sneak past and be roguey and sneaky, and you know that he's aiming for either stealth or sleight of hand. Right. So depending on the on the context, you'd give him that. Or Jane might go up to somebody and start talking. You know, being a very charisma, like forward character, you know that that's persuasion check or persuasion or into there you go. Okay. It's 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 really not that like hard to sort of pick out the skill, and more often than not, that's just what people are looking for. Is you know, half the time when they're describing a course of action, what they're doing is asking permission to roll the dice, and hopefully gain a success. Right, and that makes sense having been a player because what you are looking for is validation that you know your character and chose something smart based on what they're good at and suck at yeah exactly okay um yeah so i would say that isn't like not honestly 90 percent of gming dungeons and dragons is knowing what what check to ask for okay. um of that knowing when to ask for it and how hard to make it are two important related skills so, um, honestly, this is the the most important thing. I, I like the most important rule of GMing. I yeah. think is never make your players roll for something you're not prepared for them to fail. Okay, like that's it, good. If they need to find the book, don't make them search for it. Or if even if they get a really bad roll, they find the book. Um, obviously, if they yeah. roll really well, they'll find lots of other stuff, and you know they'll get additional clues. <laughs> But largely speaking, if the story depends on them doing a thing um, and it's not, you know, really complicated, like defeating someone in battle, 
Uh, mm -hmm. Just let them do the thing. Okay. Um, also, uh, difficulty checks. Obviously, you know you know that when you get uh, asked to roll some dice, you get you more often than not get given a, a DC, which tells you how hard it is. Actually, I very rarely give you lot the DC because oh, like tell us what we have to be. Yeah. Um, no, I've noticed that we, that we don't. Yeah, yeah, I used to, but like more often than not, I think it's more narratively interesting just to be like roll it and we'll see. Because yeah. I, I think it, if I said... Is that because your opinion might change once you actually hear the results? Yes. Okay. There it is. He's he's already peeking behind the curtain. <laughs> um, yeah, to be honest with you, like if, if you are, wanted to do something and I said, this is a 15, and you rolled a 12, you go, ah, oh, it's 12. And the moment's passed. Whereas if I say, all right, give me this check and you roll a 12, um, A, not only can I fudge the the dc if i really feel like i need to but yeah. also it gives it gives you that moment where you get to be like okay you've rolled a 12 you just about do it and it kind oh, of okay yeah 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 it makes dice rolls a little bit more interesting and exciting because i think that is so true mm. of course because it's better to because as soon as you roll the dice if say say you have as 12 to beat if you know that and you roll a 12 then you know you've done it. But it's much more exciting to hear you, or I guess the GM, say what happens in a cool way. Yeah. And, like, uh. you don't necessarily, like, obviously I think the pitfall there is that people are going to see that as you just constantly wanting to have narrative control. And you do a lot of the time have narrative control, but don't forget that that's something you can pass over very easily. Um, so if someone's like, I'm going to do this really risky thing, I've rolled a 16 like, that'll do it what does it look like and you can get them to sort of say it but right i think generally personally i don't give out dcs very often because i think it's more narratively interesting and it gives me wiggle room yeah that's just this, the because the you know you know sometimes you don't know what you want for lunch so you toss a coin and then you're like oh i wanted the other thing yeah it tells you what you really Exactly. All along. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes having somebody roll and realizing I'm disappointed with the result tells me that actually it would be better for the session if I ignored the rule I'd set myself seven seconds ago. Gotcha. And not having disclosed it means that you're freer to do that. So it's building on what we've learned so far. It's 90% knowing what check to call for and how hard to make it. Uh, and whether it's really necessary, and the other ten percent is lying. <laughs> yeah, basically. But Good. I think basically wiggle room is is very very important to give yourself as a GM, um, and that includes sort of planning sessions as well, um, which we can get round to. Do you have what? Are, what other questions have you got bouncing around? Um, to be honest, that was my only big worry is is like just absorbing enough of the rules and the maths to be able to do it quickly mm -hmm. but i also appreciate that that's not really something that can be taught as well as like you know that's just that's for me to read and that's for me to sort of practice and and and, and figure it out like you can't teach me maths <laughs> you know i i like... personally would be a terrible candidate to do that as well <laughs> yeah and you can't teach me the rules i know that i can learn the rules um but yeah all of my that was my main concern really is like how do you how how do you manage all of the all of the maths and all of the checks and all of the stats that you have to, have mm. to do and that was a very satisfying answer hooray Se second monitor yeah, and and, fo and focusing on yeah, fo yeah, fo uh, second monitor. That's simple. Didn't occur to me, and um, yeah, as as you say, focusing on on what are the important things. So, yeah, really getting those, really getting the checks down, the kind of check. Mm. So that it's, yeah, because you don't want if someone says what they want to do, you don't want to be kind of like fishing around, going like, uh, maybe that's yeah. religion or history. So yeah, I guess having that, having I'll, I'll focus on getting that stuff quickly to mind, mm -hmm. um, and and yeah, as you say, trying to trying to sort of judge is this something that needs to be rolled for, mm. 
if it is something that needs to be rolled for um not revealing the difficulty uh, yeah 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 it's handy okay um one thing i would say actually just to as a final thing on sort of when you're looking for information or when you're looking stuff up time passes weirdly when you're running a pen and paper role-playing game it okay. can feel like it is absolutely crawling um sometimes so when you are like give me one second while i look this up yeah i've i've watched live shows back when i've been like oh no and i've had this pit in my stomach I'm like i am just wasting hundreds of people's time here and about five seconds has passed um you've got more time than you think but it will always be scary to try and stop and look something up um, okay uh, especially right. in combat because combat crawls anyway like it it should follow that because obviously when you go into combat narrative time stops and you break everything down into six second rounds yeah so a round of combat <coughs> excuse me can take like 20 minutes and six seconds have gone by in the real world of course it feels painfully slow but yeah. for some reason when you're GMing you feel like you're shouldering that and it's your fault um, that is that is the worst bit of GMing that's the most uncomfortable bit uh, I'll, I'll try and bear in mind when it comes to combat that whenever I've played d and I love combat and I'm basically spending the whole combat round I love when it crawls because I feel like great this is more time to think of something to do hmm. and everyone playing is trying to think of the best coolest most efficient move you know and and so like when you know if if jane is taking a little while to sort of just dis describe agonizing blast or something i'm like good precious sec <laughs> precious seconds you know to sort of be like so yeah i will i'll try and i'll try and bear in mind okay. that i'll try and bear that in mind because because I, I, I can i know that you find combat um stressful and, and slow and, and yes yeah. but i but i yeah well, it's good to have that perspective, though. I didn't realise that that was kind of. I can't speak for the others, but I, I, I enjoy combat. It's, good. You know, it plays out like a sort of cool anime in my head. Yeah. And you know, also I suppose, you know, I was raised on like Dragon Ball Z and stuff, where you have those like epic fights that take, that episodes. take like three. Yeah, they take like episodes and episodes, <laughs> but it's supposed to canonically have taken six seconds or something. Yeah. <laughs> God, I didn't even think about that. I miss Krillin. Oh, Johnny. Well, no. it's good someone misses Krillin. <laughs> oh. oh, no. And his Destructo disc. Oh, I forgot about the Destructo disc, in fairness. Mm. Mm. Oh, little frisbee. Is there a Dragon Ball Z RPG? There must be. Surely there is. I wouldn't want to design the combat for that game, but... Um, right, I reckon... Yeah. Uh, it's time for you to get a peek behind the curtain at some of my, we'll call them notes, because okay. they are not very comprehensive. All right. Oxventure Live, uh, 29th May. Yes, so this is the Oxventure that Whoa. became, it looks Ooh. more looks more impressive than it is. Um, this is the one that became Elf Hazard, where Meryl One was sort of summoned to go back to the community she came from. Yeah. Um, you'll notice uh, of this dark almost half of it just covers the opening 10 minutes yes I, i'm just i'm i'm skimming through it now yeah i can see that um Adrahel. yeah there's the yeah it's like the, there's the there's the turtle the yeah. beginnings of ox ventures are the ones that hew closest to my notes overall and it's probably the thing i spend the most time actually writing down rather than just keeping in my head okay because it is the part of the adventure in which i know everyone's going to be actually listening rather than going and doing their thing right what everyone is very good at in the oxventurers guild is waiting until the story hook is in um at the start it's always like all right well i've gone to the bar and i've come back and i've spilt my drink everywhere like, yeah. fine, everyone's doing stuff and they've all got their own sort of sense of initiative, but it's But nobody all... says, like, I leave the bar and get on my horse and ride to a mountain. Or... Exactly. Yeah. So this is basically my my greatest chance to set the tone for the rest of the game. Ooh. Okay. So, um, in the one where you were supposed to be hunted, deliberately stupid, like... The whole like, help, help, help thing 
where the oh, floor yeah, bottomed yeah. away. Uh, I wanted you to feel frustrated. I wanted you to feel annoyed that you'd been duped and that you were being forced into this position. Yeah. Um, so that's that's why I sort of took pains to describe it in that way. In this one, um, you're sat in a pub, everything's kind of normal, and then I wanted, even though I wanted the, the delivery mechanism to be stupid because I thought a giant tortoise with a bandolier of messages was A, funny, and B, something else might conceivably do. It's but, very Meryl when. Exactly. Um, the minute that letter came out, I wanted her to feel like this was a, a, an omen. You know, I wanted it to feel weighty and mm. that suddenly she had, um, like, a duty or, you know, a, a, a task that she wasn't really looking forward to, to doing. Um, Is that to sort of, like, try and minimise the chance that she would... I mean, I'm sure Ellen would never ignore the story hook, but, mm. but is it to sort of minimise the that small risk? Um, not really. It was kind of more character driven. Okay. Because I think I think with a lot of players, not with all players, but with a lot of players, you give them the hook and they're like, "Wow, this is the thing." Like we're we're probably going to go do the thing. Like it's yeah. You it is probably the one time I think in terms of a meta mindset of what I can get the players to do. Okay. Like, if they've not been offered up a different story hook, their choices are either pursue that one or ask for something completely different. And to be clear, I've definitely had groups do that and be like, nah, I'm going to go off this way. At which point I've gone, all right, fine, and we've done something else. You all um, die. But yeah. I do like that. Um, I would say, I would say that a lot of players consider that to be impolite. To just go, thank you for crafting this this story hook, we're going to ignore it and go punch the I fisherman. should say, yeah, shockingly rude. I mean, it doesn't like, it doesn't bother me when it happens, but it, it it's definitely a sense of like, oh, okay, you're just making my job harder today. That's fine. Let's let's fight. So, um, but that's why I think I spend more time setting the scene. And then, if we carry on with this, you'll notice that actually, on the way to the um, to the actual adventure, there's almost nothing it's off to the forest because I know that you're all going to think about how you would go to a forest I don't need to write down there is a wagon waiting or you know horses can be purchased because we all know that that's a thing like yeah you'll basically one of you will be like oh can we I guess can we uh and Mike says you know I'll get on my giant war hand I'll be like yeah that's fine that's there this is you don't need to commit energy to planning every single thing mm. especially since entire sections of game can be just fast forwarded through like I don't do it so much when we're on camera because everyone always has a, an amusing way of getting somewhere and I think you're all very good at telling the story of how you get from A to B but um, when I'm running games sort of just for fun a lot of the time I'll say like look <clears throat> you know, this is a three-day ride from, um, you know, Salina to, to Dodge City, Kansas. Uh, unless anyone wants to do anything in particular, we can just montage this bit. And okay. if people are like, no, no no particular conversations, no particular actions, I'll be like, okay, you spend the three days, you know, you talk, you stay up late around the campfire, blah, 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 just describe it and pff, straight on to the next thing. Nice. Um, you don't have to worry about the linking details very much. Okay. Um, what I did want to do was uh, obviously give you um, sort of something to deal with on the way to Marilyn's parents just to make things a bit more kind of interesting and I guess signposty that you were entering someone else's kind of realm like you were getting getting more magical with it um, yeah. which is why I've written the extensive notes a shimmering pool do not disturb the shimmering pool something protects it brackets it's, it's dryads. Dry ads. Is um, that why you were so happy when when we saw the shimmering pool? The first thing I said was I put my feet in it. Or it was fun. Like it was a really, really fun moment because to be honest with you. I'd um, love to say it had occurred to it would it had genuinely occurred to, I would love to say I would love to say that I was being salty and flippant when I said that, but I didn't think it would be magic or anything like that. I just thought It was nice. a shimmering pool. Well that's a shimmering pool, yeah. Yeah. Well that's kind of that's kind of lovely in like a because that's 
just the kind of intensely pure thing Dob does that I love. But also, honestly, my thoughts about the, the pool hadn't gone further than this. I didn't know how the Dryads were going to react. So I could have had them run and try and hack you to pieces and plunge you straight into combat. I kind of thought like a, a standoff might be more interesting in the moment. Um, but that was a fun bit for me because all I had written in caps was do not disturb the shimmering pool. And the first thing that happened was it was disturbed. So yeah. it was a fun, it was a creative challenge for me on the spot to be like, oh, okay, how am I going to play this? Um, what, were you, what were you expecting to have? Because you've got like, looking at the document there, you've got bullet point, a shimmering pool, do not disturb the shimmering pool, something protects its brackets, its dryads. Mm -hmm. And then the next bullet point after that is nothing to do with the shimmering pool. It's like on to the next stage of the adventure. Yep. So what would have happened if, I can't remember exactly how you described it, but I think it was like you arrive in a glade and there's a, a, a shimmering pool in the center. Mm -hmm. What would you have done if if we'd have all said like oh we all go and look at it or... um well i would have asked for a wisdom perception check and um depending on the results it would have been you know this thing is quite obviously magical um there are signs that it is tended like the grass around it is neatly trimmed yada 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 and on nice. a higher success someone would spot a dryad hiding in the tree okay. which wouldn't be that easy but um, nonetheless, you know, that's, you can sort of give breadcrumbs to kind of peel back the curtain and be like, this thing is special. And what's that over there? Basically. And I suppose the key thing is that obviously looking at this document, it's clear that this is kind of like a little, little bit of bottle entertainment. Yeah. Like a diversionary fun on the way to the main fun. Mm -hmm. But I suppose as your, because what I'm thinking what I'm thinking looking at this is like, well, we may we may have not done anything with the pool and then mm -hmm. and then what would have happened? But I suppose what I'm forgetting is that in the moment we didn't know that there was something beyond the shimmering pool. So yeah. I think whatever happened, we would have stayed with the shimmering pool until the the thing, a capital T, capital T of the pool, which is that it's protected by dryads, mm -hmm. had somehow born fruit or Yeah. Or, or, been revealed so the the reason i like to plan this loosely and i will say mm. that i think versus other gms i do plan very very loosely um is that this pull like it can be as important or insignificant as we like um you could have said a pull that's neat and just gone and it, i would have said okay that's fine and you know what actually we've won ourselves five ten minutes back um okay. You could have entered combat with the Dryads and resolved it and, you know, um, carried on. Same outcome, you've you've left, you've had a bit of side fun, yada yada yada. If everyone got super super obsessed with the pool and you stayed there for ages, again that's not really a problem because the thing that you're going to do is less about the location and more about the people you're meeting. So if you're still at the pool, just bring the people to you. Right, like you could have had Merowyn's father emerge from the woods or something. Yeah, to scare or off the dry hats. anyone. Like, yeah, it's it sounds counterintuitive um, for me to say that this pull segment doesn't matter um, because obviously I've designed it and I wanted to put it in there and I wanted people to have fun with it. But in terms of the narrative, how big or how small it is as a moment is irrelevant. Okay, it's just okay. it's it's like. I threw it in your in in your path to see what you do with it, uh, and that's what you did with it, and it was quite nice. Um, it's kind of this is actually the first time I sort of I'd pulled something in that was established as sort of a a, a world law thing from um, the Breakfast Club, the sort oh, yeah. of dicebreaker Eurogamer crossover, because they went through some woods once and uh, they found some thieves who'd been. Um, slaughtered uh, and uh, good bad the bad good which is Ian's character lifted a coin pouch from one of them uh, and then later on the dryads were, like tried to enrapture him and then tried to kill him um, and they worked out that it's because he had this stolen gold he'd, he'd basically upset the balance of right. the wood according to their rules the minute he dropped it they didn't care about him anymore Okay. so I kind of 
In my head, I quite liked that dryads have a sense of order, and if you disturb it, then they'll notice you. Otherwise, they're kind of neutral. Um, cool. So that was just something I sort cool. of wanted to play around with, because now, to me, in Geth, forest equals dryads equals you're in our house, be careful how you behave. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that was it. And then, again, you kind of... You arrived, and obviously there was some, you know... I had to introduce some characters... Uh, I introduced Erowan the Elder as he's sort of written further down the dock uh, and then yep. I just pulled a bunch of other names out because it's always good to have names on a list in a notebook um, and there was just sort of talk to sort of describe what the ritual was because you know obviously Ellen had kind of filled you in to be like I've got to pick a name I don't really want to pick a name but establishing that tension between her and the community when they're all like shouldn't you be happy you're becoming an adult like that was just a bit of fun scene setting and is that did you talk to ellen about this adventure beforehand did a you kind little of... bit she had actually suggested um because we i i can't remember when it had come up but it had come up whether she had taken a new name or not right and she she was like oh i looked it up here it is marilyn's not taken her name yet i was like well should we do something with this like she said yeah let's so she sort of she knew this was coming and she knew she had already told me that Marilyn wouldn't want to take a new name. So it was very easy for me to take that, that grain of an idea and be like, okay, well, let's put her under pressure to take a name. Nice. And it was that easy. Um, well, that, that straightforward, really. Um, and again, so it's in this, in this way, we're kind of mimicking the structure we had before, like... Okay, it doesn't really help that it's all in my head, but uh, it was so it's kind of important social set, scene setting, free play, and then we've done it again. So we've come to the the um, the Wood Elf community. They're like, "Here's what is expected of you. It's going to happen in this time, and then you were free to do what you wanted." Okay. So you'll notice here, um, I've got three objectives that never came up. Like they're preparing for a party. They need we to could get... have been milking a goat. I know. Could have gathered berries. So shocked bare my headphones fell off. <laughs> could have gathered berries, milked a goat, or hunted for food. Um, but you know what? Thankfully, everyone had other ideas. Um, because immediately after the conversation with Arrow and the Elder, uh, I, I put Prudence and Corazon's noses out of joint. They're like, well, I'm going to look into this. So. Oh, yeah, that's right. They wanted yeah. to investigate the um, the village elder whose name was... Uh, Erowan. Erowan, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. Um, so that's something in hindsight I could have foreseen because they always want to investigate and find out why something stinks. You know? Yeah, they do. But it's not hard to, to sort of... Once they do that, once they decide, I'm not going to milk a goat, I'm going to go look around this house... Even though it's not written down there, you can imagine a house. You know, like it's yeah. not that difficult. So, um, you'll notice uh, on the next sort of paragraph, Meryl will be asked to pick a name. If she refuses, she'll be told she did not make the decision lightly. She'll be permitted to leave, but the forest will not permit her to return to the community. Uh, okay. I, I knew that she was going to be given something that would mark her for death. Um, right. So, the amulet of protection. Protection in quotes. Yeah. Uh, and Adrell would have seen upset, yada, yada, yada. That's if... That's what would have happened if they hadn't already worked out what was really going on. Right, okay. As it was, uh, you'll remember Corazon went to, into his house, found uh, one brooch of iron and sort of a little gold circlet. Um, sort of two things. Yeah. Uh, and then the ledger, which mentioned names, and then the name they took... And with some people, they didn't have another name, and it said just Iron, meaning they had suffered the same fate that Marilyn was in danger of having. That was some very good on-the-fly environmental storytelling <laughs> to, to get across what, what presumably you originally intended. You would have a character explain in yeah. plain English. But th So yeah. this, is, this is, I think, um, a good example of, I think, the, the most important skill when you're planning a session is that the most important thing for you to fix in your head are the little bits of information that tell the story 
uh, and they should be kept modular so you can move them around. Okay. So, you know, it it was... Um, I mean, it's very kind of you to say it's good environmental storytelling, but really all I did was take the information that somebody was going to explain, as you say, and I made it into objects. So when uh, Jane and Andy are like, oh, we want to go explore this house, you're like, okay, well, in this next house explorey bit, I have to get across the elements of the story that there's something up in the village and that the amulets of protection that they're giving people who refuse to take a name are in fact marking them for death. Exactly. That's it. Cool. And it's... if we'd have said we want to go and swim in the river mm -hmm. uh, and not talk to anyone <laughs> because we're all covered in grease or something. <laughs> um, I. What would I have done? Maybe you would have found something in the river. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you'd like found something that someone was trying to dispose of where no one could see it. Yeah, or even more macabre. Like the first thing that sprang to my head there was you find a you find a skull, uh, and oh. then you find a, an elf corpse with the iron brooch on yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I also would have brought a drill down to the river to hang out, but also just kind of in that concerned friend way, being like, "You are gonna take a name, right? Because right. you know." You'll be cast out, and that could be bad. Because another important modular point of the story is getting across that it will be bad if, that, you know, with the consequences of being cast out of the village. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I've talked about this before, but when I plan an adventure, I plan backwards. Because okay. you, I mean, right, you're, you know, you've, you sort of you've seen the notes and you've played that actual session you know what the the whole you know what the crux of it was what the big reveal was that anyone who defied the elder was condemned to die yeah really all you have to do then is work out the crucial bits of information that lead to to that revelation and that conflict and drop them backwards like little breadcrumbs which is why i talk about keeping it modular so you can move it around so the the iron brooch um the book was just a serendipitous thing but um the concerns of the people around meryl when like these are all just little clues leading up to the big like reveal and the big revelation so honestly in terms of planning loosely as long as you've got fixed in your head what the big thing is and how it works you will just find moments to drop stuff in and it becomes a second nature thing where so someone will still ask a question and you'll just go brilliant i've got this i know i'll let you know and the manifestation of it from that thought of let's give them this crumb to actually communicating it to the players might be as small as somebody just looking smug while they answer a question because right. players probe and they want to look through things so yeah. You know, it could be like, oh, do, do a lot of people not, not take the name? Oh, you know, they, not many. We don't hear from them very often. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. Like, everyone's obviously like, that means you're killing them. And you yeah. can go, okay. yes. Yeah. Yes, we are. So that's kind of, like, I realise I've sort of really sort of rushed you through that. I mean, we're not even finished sort of going through the session, but that... No, that's, uh, that's, um, that's, uh... Structurally, that is so interesting and helpful. That idea of key story beats not being particular locations or items or something, but but like bit, well, I think modular was the word you used. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's it seems so uh, counterintuitive that that you plan backwards, as you say, and yet the and yet the amount of planning get for the beginning of the adventure is quite heavy and then it gets just like lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. It's, it's probably end. because that that is just the combination of it because I'm going backwards. Yeah. yeah like it, um yeah, but it, it yeah, it's making it's making sense to me. Good. Good. Um and yeah, to be honest, if you just look through the rest of those notes like it kind of all comes comes through together like it's like I know that there's bad stuff out in the forest. It's banshees. So going into that that ceremony, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I didn't have to know because uh, okay, it was going to resolve at, itself. At the at the end here, mm. um, what do these numbers mean next to? Oh, that's initiative. 
Oh, right. Okay, so you were editing this document as we went on. Yep. That's the initiative order. So of, one right, Banshee right. was on nine, uh, 19, and uh, that's when it had 29 hit points. Oh, cool. And then uh, the Banshee that wasn't bothered. Oh, I think that was maybe the one that caught um, Erwan. But, like, honestly, that resolved itself, the whole thing. The minute we got to that ceremony, I was like, okay, well, we're all on the train now, so let's keep going. Let's just see where it ends up. Nice. Um, I've used this example a lot, but I, th I feel like GMing is like being Gromit on the front of the train in the wrong trousers and laying the track. Um, and you know what all the pieces of track are, because you've built them. So as long as you've got them all to hand, you can just... just Interesting. Plot them out. I suppose the other, the other thing is that... Um that's probably worth mentioning is that a few times in this you've, you've talked about time like this take oh like we've bought ourselves five minutes here or you know like this takes mm. 30 seconds i suppose the um the extra wrinkle when you gm for us that maybe most people who, who try this won't be as as pressurized with is is the idea of doing running this to time mm. And obviously that's something that if I'm going to do this like, you know, on, on the channel or, or on live streams or like eventually, that's obviously something that I will, I'll have to get my head around as well. But it does seem like that is an extra, uh, like a, like the proper sort of pro, like <laughs> level, like that's what, that's the three dimensional chess version. Because, you know, like you could, you could have, if, if you had friends around for the evening or something and the only time pressure was like, well, probably everyone wants to go home at about 10 p.m. Yeah. Then... Uh, but you know that you can pick it up next time exactly where you left off. Yeah. Then I imagine, I imagine all of this would be like how how different is your planning for it like a timed box venture compared to when you're when you're running a, a game, for example, for friends um, of an afternoon. I would say that I actually hmm, that's a good question. They're not hugely different, but if it's if you can believe it for a continuing campaign it's even looser because um the plan might simply be they need to travel from this city to this city here's mm. an encounter along the way the train will break down and they'll have to fight a werewolf right like um the time pressure is definitely off because i've had encounters where i've had an idea of where i want to get to and we've not we've not made it there but that's you know that's fine that's not really an issue um in terms of running things to time things to time it is partly I, th I think it is just practice at this point um if you if we go all the way back to wild wild woods you can i think you can see that i was very conscious of time and i was quite nervous about it um i even sort of made a joke where bin bag was like we must do this and we must do it swiftly in the interests of time yeah you know? yeah it definitely helps that I'm playing with people who have, you know, essentially the same job as me. Um, and so we're always conscious of, of time and getting things done. So you're all very proactive players. You don't dawdle um, much. Not much. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is partly a skill. Uh, sorry, yeah. a, well, a learned thing. But part of it is just being able to speak up and just you sort of will develop a sense for when something's taking too long but there just comes a point where you can be like okay well this happens and you can bring the situation to an end like somebody might be offended or you know the opportunity they're waiting for might pass or somebody might just come get them and be like well, what are you doing like there are there are ways to narratively nudge people along yeah um and it I'll be honest with you, I don't always get it right. You once had five minutes to kill a literal god live on the stage. Like, the whole lads, lads, oh, lads one. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, uh, there have been so many times where combat has just had to be absolutely blown through because we haven't... Or we've, we've run out of time because we were having too much fun before. Um, so it's, it is just one of those things. You just have to... It comes with practice, I think. Um, because it is an unusual thing. Like, I think, you know, you will have seen it a lot of the time. People will say that we sort of play Dungeons & Dragons on the Oak Accenture. Like, we... Yeah. Some people are, are less kind. They're like, they barely play. Um, well, I do I do listen to, uh, you know, and watch other 
campaigns you know like yeah. like other than ours and and, and th there are some main differences um you know like adherence to certain kinds of rules mm -hmm. like i don't know although i i'm yet to find i'm yet to find any i'm yet to watch any campaign where they like pay attention to like how much money everyone has or yeah like ingredients for spells or like you have stopping <sighs> to buy arrows and like i hate that stuff know, like that like that that kind of thing but that said i i do accept and i do recognize that the way we play D, &D is like we, we we lean heavily on the non-combat stuff yeah and and the not mechanical stuff i think um, i think it's we it, it's the nature of the very specific way in which we're playing yeah. uh, and i to be honest i quite like it that way like i it's 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 a different thrill playing for video versus playing you know for just just for funsies like mm. i just said that i hate you know tracking money or buying arrows and stuff like that that's not true really like you know there's a campaign i'm playing in where we have to track our ammo and we have to pay for everything and i love it like it's right. because yeah. it it feeds into the character i've got very little money but i also want to prove myself so i'm more likely to shoot my gun than other characters you know like that that is all playing into it in my head but you just you have to toss that stuff out the window when you're doing it in any form of sort of live or or to time format yeah um, and that's fine so again it's like it's all about how firm a hand you want to have on the tiller when you're running it um i like to play fast and loose because i i oftentimes the ideas the group comes up with a, a infinitely better than any scenario i could dream up and it's fun to discover them and see them play out and try and interpret what they're asking like Merylwyn's meat grinder who could have seen that coming it's like certainly but, not Merylwyn right <laughs> exactly yeah. but it's it's about as I iconic a moment as the X Venture has, has ever created you know so yeah yeah I do know what um, you mean and it's it's giving people that freedom if I had said that there was a boiling oil trap that they could use they would have done that. They would have gravitated towards it, but I didn't. So instead, we had a greased floor and a whole bunch of thorns, and a great time. A great time. Egg and you know what? We made some memories, and we did some good. <laughs> Eventually, That's how I remember it. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. So many dead paladins. But yeah. So I don't know. I realise I've fired a lot of information across your bow just now. No, but... that's all right. I've. This has been a. This has been quite a structured session, really. Mm. You know, like like sort of planning the planning planning the set planning the planning the amount of planning the right amount of planning yeah uh well i think uh before we come back and do this again i'm gonna set you some homework hey uh, all right okay homework great uh plan an ox venture uh, okay uh all right <laughs> why am i writing that down it's, it's... Stuck in my memory. <laughs> um come up with a hook okay S make some notes make some notes about what you think you'll you'll need um okay i will try and make one of these one of these google docs okay for an oxman yeah and and, uh, and 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 presumably talk you talk you through it we're gonna i think what we should do is run through it um and sort of i'll i'll i i am going to probe bits of it I cool. will. Okay. I will give you Test scenarios. Test for weaknesses. Exactly. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. And obviously, I think eventually we should make them do it. Um, yeah. You, you should GM an Ox Venture for them. Uh, so that means they're not allowed to watch any of these videos. That's all right. That's I will instruct. I'll, I'll tell them that they're banned. We, we will ban them from ban them yeah. from Dice Breaker. Um But yeah, I think that is the the next step. Um, plan Ox Venture, but plan it in your way. Don't. I would say don't look at this doc again. Okay. Or if you do, don't keep it open while you're planning. Yeah. Because right. you're not writing an Ox Venture for me, you're writing an Ox Venture for you. Yeah. The most important person to entertain. Me. Exactly. Done. Cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, this you've taken the first step on the journey to becoming uh, a, a dungeon master. So exciting. Can I ask you can I ask you one more question, which has popped yeah. into my mind, and it's not it's slightly off topic, but if I don't ask you it, it'll stress me out. Mm -hmm. Is it much harder um, running a game for higher level characters? Yes. 
Because when I imagine GMing a game, I'll be honest, I'm imagining like, what if there was a human with a wooden sword and they were in a cave with a goblin? Mm -hmm. And that to me feels like controllable and yeah, um, nice. But that's obviously not where we're at now mm -hmm. in, in Ox Venture. I find it much harder to set appropriate challenges for, for everybody. Um, which is why uh, in the most recent one, the name of which escapes me... Bone to Pick? Bone to Pick. Uh, there was a portal where monsters could have kept coming through. Yeah. I didn't know how many I'd need. Because I always forget that Merowyn has the Hammer of Dawn from Gears of War. Like, she's got Moonbeam. Yeah. I forget just how much damage rogues can deal if they, you know, if they hide. Uh, I would say genuinely my greatest weakness as, as, um, as a DM right now is underestimating the um, the high power characters um, or just not not necessarily underestimating them because I know they're powerful it's forgetting all of the ways they can get around things it's like, difficult though isn't it because you, you if you imagine like a sliding scale of enemy difficulty it's like too easy too easy like still a pushover still a pushover like blah 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 blah, blah. perfect challenge yep but then like w one millimeter above that is like too hard and they've died yes. and that is obviously not what anyone wants yeah the way i currently go about it is if i'm not slightly concerned that i've overdone it and you might be in genuine mortal danger i've probably not made it hard enough to use okay. to use but that's that's the way i look at it it doesn't have to be the way you look at it uh to 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 go back to um to elf hazard um banshees are horrible like, if you had gone, right, we'll take all four of them right now in a straight fight, it would have gone badly. They have a shriek ability that will just reduce you to zero hit points if you don't pass a saving throw. That's right, what killed okay. Erowan. They can only use it once a day, but that could have been disastrous. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could have quite easily... Someone could have got really, really hurt in that encounter. But uh, Which is kind of, I think, why I started introducing them slower. Right, But then... Right. Um, you sort of you grasp the MacGuffin. You're like, get the iron off Merowyn, get it well, on. Mike did. I well, suppose yeah. he, he should be probably deserves the credit for that. Yeah. Um, like that was it. So I think that's probably why I felt more comfortable throwing a harder encounter at you, because it's like there's a there's an escape button here. But yeah, which I suppose if I don't know if if four of us were unconscious and the last one was weak maybe you could maybe there's a sort of not too obvious way of bringing that escape button yeah oh, oh i wouldn't know. i wouldn't tpk you that's the thing like a because it's it's a show with characters people are invested in and so you know it would be senseless to just kill everyone but also i don't i don't really personally believe in tpks um if characters are like no we will fight to the last and it's what we want to do and they want to go out in a blaze of glory fine but I feel like when people are like, yeah, you know, like I threw this encounter at them session three and killed everyone. It's like, well, why did you do that? Because all, all you've yeah. done is hit the reset button. And it, it plays into that kind of, I am the dungeon master, my authority and my power are both limitless and you are my pawns. Like, that's not that's not how pen and paper role playing games work. This is a collaborative exercise. Yeah. Um, and frankly, it's quite disrespectful just to kill everyone just because yeah. you can. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you can't just be like, oh, I can't believe that happened. It's like, yes, you, you can, because you were the one who described all those things. I, I believe that I believe that you would... I don't know if you would or not, and actually, you know what? I don't want you to answer this question, but I believe that you would kill our characters. But, but I think for that to happen, circumstances would have to be right. Like, either... I don't know. I, I trust you that you wouldn't kill us unless we'd done something really dumb that actually like we we should have known better and then didn't backpedal from that straight away because sometimes we do stuff that obviously we should know better like jump down a bottomless pit or, or, or something like you know but um and you you generously find a way to leave Egbert, let's say it uh you know like hanging like by his claws or, or it's because you dare to do it and it's funny if I if yeah, I punish yeah, you relentlessly, then you'll stop doing it. Stop and we'll stop doing stop doing funny stuff. But yeah. in accordance with your wishes, I will not answer that question. Okay, 
cool. Yeah, yeah. It's better mm. not to know. It's better not to know. Yes. Well, um, I've kept you locked in this theoretical dungeon for the best part of an hour now, so I'm going to let you go, but hopefully I have given you some confidence in your journey toward becoming uh, a seasoned dungeon master. You've given me a lot to think about. I'm really excited to meet back here with the skeleton of my own Oxventure. I have no ideas right now. Great. But I trust that I will have some. Yep. Even if, if it's whatever the hook is, big or small, go with it. Cool. Okay. All right. Well, Everyone great. babies. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that because now that's all I'm going to be able to think about. If that's what it is, that's what it is. It's pretty funny. And you know that we're going to get comments now clamoring for it. Think of the fan art, Luke. Maybe just one is a baby. <laughs> okay. L little baby prudent. Um, okay, well, yeah. uh, that seems like a satisfying cliffhanger to leave everyone on. But... I think so. I think so. Thank you so much, Johnny. This is so much fun. Oh, my pleasure. I love talking about this stuff. And thanks to everyone watching uh, at home. Uh, obviously, if it, you know, if you didn't already know, please, as if you can find Luke on uh, Outside Extra at youtube.com forward slash Outside Extra. Check um, it out. Uh, you're watching Dicebreaker. That's youtube.com forward slash Dicebreaker, the channel you're already watching. Uh, and we'll be back very soon. But thank you so much, Luke. This has been this has been lovely. It's been a treat. You're, thank you, Johnny. Oh, stop. Thank you. Oh, all right. Well, bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.